but, uh, <laughs> but when we talked to the kids earlier, uh, what we're talking about is expectation. And so let me uh, just preface the main message with a little children's message. I also had them convinced they were going to eat bugs, okay, which is really kind of fun. Because when we think about this season, uh, we think about, of course, the baby Jesus. And that's what the kids know in the week we think of, of uh, angels and shepherds and uh, very excited wise men and things like that. And, and this, this, that's how Jesus is going to come to us, and with choirs of angels and things. But then we have this other guy, John. Okay, and John lives out in the wild. Okay, and when we read about John, particularly last week when we read about his description, the average person in Israel at the time wore five pieces of clothing, the average man. John only wears two. Okay, so he's sort of running around half naked. Okay, as far as we know, he doesn't have a house. He's out there eating wild honey and eating locusts. But he's still the messenger of God. And so the message for our children, and one of the messages for us, has everything to do with expectation. We may expect that beautiful baby child to be the Christ that comes to us. But the fact is, the one who comes to us might in fact be wildly dressed, smell badly, and eat bugs. Okay? And then I made that, <laughs> I had a bag there, so well, now we eat bugs. I had nice gummy worms for them, but they didn't know that to start with. <laughs> so, well, so, but, uh, but again, the, the thought is, what is our expectation? Okay? And that's really what today's gospel is about um, as well. So we were going to talk about that too, a little more definitely with the children. But I think it's important that you know what the children have, have heard as well uh, in, in any given Sunday. And it's uh, an important part of what we do. Now, for us, it's kind of odd to juxtapose this week's gospel with last week's. And if you remember, last week, John the Baptist was giving his rather colorful message that the day of the Lord is coming. And remember, he's, he's colored that with things like broods of vipers and hypocrites and all that kind of stuff. And, and if we had read just a little further last week, we would have seen the baptism of Jesus, who John fully recognizes. And remember, John is also a relative of Jesus. And so they know each other. Jesus' mother, Mary, is a relative of Elizabeth, John's mother, probably cousins. Uh, the word that's used in the Greek term uh, literally means relative. If they were actually sisters, as is as sometimes interpreted, uh, it's likely that that word would be used. And we do the same thing. You know, those of us that are going out visiting family this, this coming season, you know, I, I would tell you, I'm going to my brother's house, not I'm going to my relative's house. And so if, if you look at that closeness. So at best, probably, Jesus and John are second cousins. And if you want to know how that works, see me afterwards. I'll explain it to you. It's a nice genealogy thing. But the fact is, John knows Jesus. So why is he asking this question? Are you the one who's coming? Why is he asking that? Well, first, a great deal has happened between that first meeting that we read about in Matthew 33 and here in Matthew 11. Unfortunately, none of the Gospels give us a really good timeline. So it's hard to tell exactly how much time has passed between various events in the Gospel. Scholars tell us that Jesus' ministry lasted about three years, so it's obviously within that period. And we also know John has been busy. He's been preaching and baptizing. He's been in the wilderness long enough to build a large following. So he's been out there a while. Now, he's finally arrested for calling out the tyrannical Herod Antipas. He was the king uh, and pretty much a Roman toady, to be honest with you. This, this is what he does. Now, while Herod had been visiting Rome some years earlier, he seduced his sister-in-law, then came home, dismissed his wife, who well, was writing a letter, so he got rid of her, got his brother to dismiss his wife because she's now an adulteress, and then he married her. And John, big surprise, took offense to that in his own rather colorful way, and it landed him in prison. And all three of the Synoptic Gospels tell us that story, probably the clearest in Luke, uh, in the third chapter of Luke, if you want to look that up. Now, John would have been imprisoned in Herod's fortress at a place called Machiris, 
which was in the mountainous area near the Dead Sea. And dungeons at this time period were at the lowest level of that. So they're in the foundation. Uh, they would have been below ground, it would have been small, it would have been dank, it would have been dark, and generally it would have been miserable. Now at that time, it was actually up to a prisoner's family and friends to care for them unless they wanted them to receive just the normal, everyday, awful treatment uh, that, that the uh, prisoners were given. And so they can visit. And obviously John's disciples are visiting him, otherwise obviously they would not have gotten this message. So it's, it's really from this very hopeless place that John asks these questions of Jesus. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect another? Now, there are two reasons why John might have asked this question. First, and very likely, it's so his disciples could hear the answer. So his disciples can hear the answer. Imagine their agony. And it just, it's just incredible. Here they've been following this man for months, perhaps years. And now he's in these conditions with very little hope of coming out alive. Many of them quite possibly thought John was the much-awaited Elijah who would bring back the glory days of ancient Israel. But given his current condition, that isn't looking real good. And yet they have not lost faith in John. So is John giving them the opportunity to learn what he already knows about Jesus? Maybe. Maybe. There's a second possibility, and there may be a combination of truth in both of them, that this has to do with John himself and what his expectation of Jesus was. Now, when we look at John's message and we look at Jesus' message, we get two very, very different messages. They are nothing alike. John is preaching a destructive coming of God's judgment Repent now before it's too late and you face the fiery wrath of an angry God. Prepare for those final days. Now, Jesus also preaches preparing for the final days and does occasionally speak of the judgment to come. But Jesus' message, unlike John's, is one of the love of a merciful God who offers hope through grace. Undeserving as we may be, God loves us and is offering us a choice, not an easy one, but a choice nonetheless, that if we accept the love of God through Jesus Christ, our ultimate future is in the kingdom with God. Is John, like so many others of the day, expecting a wrathful Jesus so that in the misery of his confinement he needs to clear that up? Wouldn't we find ourselves, perhaps, like that in similar circumstances, questioning even things we might know? Jesus' answer echoes across ages. Don't go back and tell John what I'm saying. Tell John what I'm doing. Healing the sick, giving the blind sight, making the lame walk, curing leprosy, raising the dead, and preaching the good news to the poor. All of these things, of course, are foretold in the Old Testament. But most important here is to let John, and 2,000 years later, us, know the love of God, not by what Jesus claims or others claim about Jesus, but what we can see ourselves in acts of saving grace that happened before our eyes all the time. Jesus' last comment is for John, but it is also for us. Don't let what you expected cause you to doubt. Look, see, and know that God is acting perhaps not as you and I expected, but as God sees best to act, and keep faith. Keep faith. Now, if our gospel ended there, that would be a powerful enough message. But Jesus isn't done with this exchange. 
And Jesus will always have the last word. He continues with the theme of expectation. Speaking of John, he asks, what did you go to the wilderness to see? Okay, we know that John attracted crowds and big crowds. Well, why? So Jesus then uses a very common expression of the day. Did you go to see a reed shaken by the wind? Well, that actually had multiple meanings. Now, at that time, in Israel and Judea, uh, any puddle of water that was around for more than a few hours would have reeds growing up around the edges of it. So this was something that everybody saw pretty much every day. And, of course, everybody saw reeds bending in the wind. So one of the interpretations of this is, did you go out to see something so common that you see every day? And, and we know that John is hardly common. So obviously you did not go out to see that ordinary sight. But that expression also meant okay, if someone was shaken by the wind, or reed shaken by the wind, they were spineless. They, they just had no will of their own. And that certainly is not John the Baptist. Okay, so did you go out to see a spineless man? No, you didn't. You didn't. Hence people went to see him. Did you go out to see someone wearing beautiful clothes? If so, you're in the wrong place. Of course not. That's not what you went to see. Did you go to see a prophet? And again, remember, many, many people at this time are seriously awaiting Elijah to come and strike down the Romans. Okay, so they're looking for that prophet. Now, a prophet, remember, does two things. First of all, they have a message from God, and then they also have the courage to deliver that message. Okay. Now, John, uh, Jesus tells us John is beyond that. John's message is like no others, and it isn't. If you really look at the Old Testament and what John is saying, they're really not the same message. Jesus knows what John is foretelling is the coming of an entirely new age. Not one where the destruction and wrath of God are the visible signs of his mighty presence, but rather one where God's love is the visible sign of his mighty presence. And Jesus tells us plainly, John is the greatest of the messengers. But even this great messenger will be least among those in heaven. Why? What has he done? What is John lacking that the faithful who come after him have seen? And the answer, according to the great biblical scholar William Barclay, is, as he calls it, fundamental and simple. And it is. John never got to see the saving grace of the cross. He's executed before that. He never gets to see the saving grace of the cross. We have. We have seen that. That doesn't diminish John's importance. But we have seen by the love and grace of God what even this great man could not see. The ultimate act on the cross demonstrating the love of God for us. How magnificent is that? So as we are in the midst of this season of expectation, we're in Advent, Christmas, the coming of a new pastor. What does this gospel tell us? It tells us not to let our expectations about Jesus get in the way of our actually seeing his actions and the opportunities he offers us because they're not what we expected. We expect in this season a beautiful, chubby, pink-faced baby boy surrounded by angels and shepherds and animals and exotic wise men. But suppose Jesus shows up in our lives more like John the Baptist, in crude clothes, smelling badly with wild hair and munching on a bunch of bugs. Would we see him? Or would we be like John? and in need of some sort of verification before we believed because that didn't meet our expectation. When we have our youth activities, 
We often speak about what we call Jesus moments with our youth. Times when both the visible work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit confronts us, or an opportunity to act out our faith lands very suddenly in our laps, all when we don't expect it. It's an exciting part of our faith together when we see those Jesus moments. But we also talk about how many of those we might miss because we didn't expect them or because our expectations were different. God delivers to us what God sees fit for us, not what we may expect, but we must be ready in spite of our expectations. So in this season, prepare. Prepare for the expected by all means, but also be prepared for the opportunities the unexpected brings. My friends, we are surrounded by the love of God every moment of our lives, even in those moments when we expect it least or think we don't deserve it. Look always for that Jesus moment. By grace, it is there for us if we only have the faith to see it. May you truly be blessed in this wonderful time of expectation. And may the glory of the risen Christ surround you, guiding your actions, upholding your faith, and being with you as you walk through the days of your life. Amen.